Everything we're going to talk about is based off a process. It's the same process that I use to find new clients for my company. It's the same process I use to find speaking gigs, to find guest authoring gigs. It's the process I use to find and target people online who I want to become friends with, who I want to get to know because they can help me. Either they can hire my firm, they can get me a speaking gig, they can let me write, okay? So it's the exact same process that you, as a student, can use to find a job, okay? Now, how many of you are seniors? Okay, so you guys are all getting out in Maine looking for a job, right? Okay, the rest of you are juniors? You might be looking for internships, et cetera. Okay, so the whole process is designed to help you do that. And here's why you need to have a process. Because basically, in our industry, unfortunately, you did not go into law or CPA or host rock concerts outside. <laughs> in those industries, they actually recruit seniors to come work for them. I used to love when I, my friends that were in the accounting and business school, oh, yeah, well, I'm going on a recruiting trip to Deloitte and Touche today. I'm like, oh, really? Nice. Must be good to actually have a job when you get out of school. Our industry doesn't do that, right? We never have. We didn't 20 some years ago when I was in your shoes. Uh, we never will, okay? I mean, we just won't. It's not our industry. We hire when we need to hire, especially if you're on the ad agency side or planning to be on the ad agency side of the world. We only hire when we need people, okay? And then, unfortunately, if we don't need them, we get rid of them. It's just how this thing works. Now, the good news is you are in a much better place than I was. Back in my day when you had to walk uphill both ways, barefoot in the snow to the college career office, this is what we had right here. That was it. That was the sum total of what I had to make an impression on a prospective employer. And guess what? Mine looked pretty much like everyone else's. If you really were crazy creative, maybe you put it on colored paper or you die cut it so that it wasn't a perfect square, maybe it was some other shape. I was very cutting edge, I had both. Mine was both on colored paper and die cut because I worked uh, at an ad agency who was housed with a printer, so they did it for me for free. And the beauty was that you know, if you could get anybody on the phone, you could at least go, they would give you, well, which one are you? There's like 30 on my desk. You go, well, I'm the blue one that has the cool die cut, and maybe they would actually find it. But this is it. That's not a great way to make an impression because it's really hard to stand out. The other problem was we had very limited information. For me to try to find, because I was going into the ad agency world, for me to try to find where the jobs might be, I could read Ad Age, I could read Ad Week, maybe a couple other marketing, and I would actually follow like what agencies were winning business, because if you win a new account, you might need to hire for that account, right? Or if you lost a piece of business, you probably weren't hiring anybody, I didn't need to waste my time sending a resume to you. But it was very difficult. You didn't have a lot of information. You ended up spending a lot of time on the phone, calling people, chasing down names, looking for things. And back then, we didn't have all you could eat long distance on our cell phone. We actually had to pay for it. So it was a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive. Luckily, nowadays, you don't have that problem. Now, the people who have the jobs in our industry are still partially hidden from you. For instance, right now, I could be hiring. You don't know. But you have a technological advantage that we didn't have 20 years ago. And that if you will take advantage of, if you will follow a disciplined process starting now, you will have a much better opportunity of getting a job vis-a-vis -vis the other 10,000 graduates who look just like you walking out the door on mid-May, okay? Now, the thing you have to understand, though, is this is not a, I'm gonna start today and it's gonna produce results tomorrow kind of thing. What has never changed, what is not going to change, and what will be the truth for the standing of time is that it takes time to make friends. And that's what you're trying to do. Come on, guys, just place this up here in the front. I won't make fun of you for being late. It still takes time to make friends. What you are, how many of you lo are looking to get into the agency side of the world? Good, most of you are smart enough to go client side. You'll make more money. On the agency side of the world, it's absolutely 1,000% a relationship-based business. Every job you get, every job you will get, will always be based on who you know, who you've worked with in the past, et cetera. But even on the client side of the world, because there's so much movement between agency, client, 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 et cetera, this is a huge relationship-based business. Now, all industries to some extent are. But what I have found in my 20-some-odd years is in the marketing industry, because it's okay to, ship, to jump jobs in the marketing world a lot, 
I think you'll find it as you go through uh, whatever the number is that most people have X number of jobs in their life. I would be willing to bet that if you did that same analysis in the marketing and advertising field, it would double. It's acceptable in our business to jump jobs often, every year, two, three years, because that's how you learn. It's how you spread. That's how you get experience. That's how you work on different things. And I think marketing people tend to be somewhat intellectually ADD anyways. <laughs> so this is a relationship business. I'll give you a perfect example. Yesterday morning, I'm on the phone with a new business prospect that a friend of mine and a colleague had um, recommended talk to us. And he's telling me about uh, the marketing gal. He's an old guy, old Southern guy. A marketing gal at this retailer that he really wanted to target with this strategic initiative and how could we help him. And he's talking about her and I'm like, well, are they good in social media? Because my firm does digital and social. And I pull up their Facebook page and he's telling me, well, kind of. And I'm looking and two of my friends like this, this company, one of which was a gal who has no business liking this company for any other reason than if she might work for them. So I asked the man, I said, so excuse me, what was the gal's name? I don't remember, I'll have to look it up. I, just in the off chance. Could it have been, and she had a very unique name, or has a very unique name. And he's like, oh yeah, that's her. Small world. How do you know her? I worked with her, she was my current wife's boss when we got out of college because my wife and I met working on the same piece of business. And I worked directly with her for years. I knew her quite well. Oh, that's awesome. This is a relationship business. What you are about to enter into is going to be based on who you know, not what you know. And I, I know you hear that a lot. It's a cliche. I'm telling you, it's true. There are a lot of very successful idiots in the marketing world. <laughs> A, you don't have to be that bright to do this anyways, which helps guys like me. But B, it's a relationship business. So what I'm going to teach you how to do is start building relationships today with people like me who you aren't otherwise going to meet. Okay? That's the whole gig. But here's the thing, okay? It's the old story. I can lead you to water, but I cannot make you do this. If you think this is easy, if you think this is, oh, I'm just going to bang this out and I'm going to get a job, you're going to fail. This is a very disciplined, long-term process. You start today and you do it, if you're smart, for the rest of your career. Because this is how you're gonna find your first job, your second job, and your 10th job, all right? So, anybody know what that word is? Anybody wanna even try to say it? Propinquity. Memorize that word. It is the science of how relationships form. Social scientists have studied how it is we as individuals, as human beings, form relationships with other people. The scientific principle is called propinquity. What they have found is that proximity, either physically or psychologically, between two people leads, is a direct causational variable to the fact that they form a relationship. Now, normally when I do a presentation about this, I'm talking to a bunch of business people and I ask them, you know, how many people in here married somebody that they worked with? Um, but being none of you have jobs yet, and hopefully none of you are married of yet, that's probably not going to be. But anybody here date anybody that, like, you know, was in your classes? Maybe it was in your same club? It's okay. I married the chick that I worked with. It's okay. Put your hands up. I'm not going to judge you. That's called industrial propinquity. There's actually an over-indexing of people who work together end up getting married. The reason is they're in very close proximity to one another. They're constantly running into each other. And that's the philosophy of how relationships be. If you go back and think about how did I become friends with the person that I'm friends with? How did I, as you go through life, you're going to have lots of different friends. And what you're going to find out is the commonality is proximity. The people you're around the most, huh, big surprise, end up becoming your friends. People you're not around as much tend to fall out of friendships or maybe they never become friends. So the way you do this in this hiring world is very simple. So what is your name? Rachel. So me and Rachel, we meet here today, right? Hi. And me and Rachel, we now are aware of one another. Maybe we see each other later because she takes my advice and goes to the French Quarter Fest. Right. You did? <laughs> you can always go back. <laughs> you can never eat enough seafood or drink enough beer. So, I didn't say that second part. <laughs> I'll edit that out of the final piece. So let's say we run into each other and I see her face. I'm like, oh, I know that girl from somewhere. I probably maybe don't remember her name, but I know maybe I've met her, okay, right? And then maybe I go, yeah, don't I know you? And so, yeah, yeah, I was at your thing. Okay, now I know something more about her. 
If I keep running into her, I'm going to get to know more things about her, right? Because each time you meet somebody, you tend to learn something new about them. The more I get to know about her, the more I can find things about her that I like. Maybe we like the same food. Maybe we drink the same beer. Maybe we like to do the same things. I'm going to find things that I can like about her. And if I find enough things that I like about her, the theory is that when I have a job, she's going to be first in line mentally for that job. That is your job. Right now, your job is to use digital tools to get to this spot right here. The way you're going to get it is make sure that you run into the people who can hire you more often than anybody else runs into them. Okay? You're going to create propinquity. Because there's two ways to have propinquity. You can wait for serendipity. Okay? Odds really suck on that. Not great. Or you can plan the serendipity. What I would encourage you to do is spend the rest of your collegiate career planning serendipity, plan propinquity, plan to make sure that you are running into people who can offer you a job when you graduate as many times as possible. Because that's how you're going to begin to form a relationship with them. That's how you're going to be the person that when I have that invisible job and I'm thinking, man, I really need an entry level person to work in my social profiling group as an analyst. Who am I going to go with? That's right. That was totally fake, by the way. <clears throat> that's the philosophy. Now, so the question is, OK, that's really great. How do I do that? Well, every person in the world has what's called propinquity points. Propinquity points are a series of places that we go to, hang out, either to acquire information, meet people, hang out with friends, etc. cetera. Um, this part over here, most of you are probably really familiar with, social media. Okay? Social media, the biggest benefit to you of social media is with the exception of that one right there, Facebook, these two right here, great places to meet people that look a lot like me. People who have jobs and can offer them to you. Twitter by far the best. The reason for that is it's public. My profile is public. Most people's profiles are public. Therefore, you can find them. And we'll talk about that. LinkedIn, a little bit better. Their profiles are public, but to communicate with them, you have to get permission. But there's some ways around that as well, we'll talk about. Facebook, if you can get on somebody's Facebook, that's gold. Because all the yim yam about how people are abandoning Facebook and everything, it's all a bunch of muck. People are still here. That's still the 800 pound gorilla. Okay, so if you can get to there, that's gold. If you can get down here to like to their email, that's platinum. You can get permission to email me back and forth. You are sitting pretty. Now, there's also this over here. These are all content zones. We are creatures of habit. I have certain blogs, certain websites, certain magazines, certain television, certain broadcasts. There are things that I consistently refer to to educate myself, stay on top of my game, et cetera. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can find those, because you want to find those. You want to be reading the same stuff I'm reading. You want to be consuming the same information, because if I think it's important, you probably ought to think it's important, because theoretically, I know a little bit more about the business than you do. So it helps point you in the right direction, because how many of you um, use books in your classes? Anybody? Yeah, every one of those is out of date. Was out of date the day it was printed, probably the day it went to the press. The biggest challenge for you is that you actually aren't being prepared for the world you're going to enter in. Your first two years on the job is going to be an apprenticeship. You're in the last of the great apprenticeship industries of the world. Because what you are taught in college is great. It's sort of like economics. Sounds really good in theory. It doesn't work for crap in the real world. <laughs> okay? Economists say all this theory. And then the people who actually run businesses for a world, you talk to them, and they'll tell you all that stuff the economist talks about. Yeah, that's all a bunch of great theory, but that's not how the real world works. Okay? Marketing is the same way. So. You're going to have to, the best way for you to study and get up to speed, find the people you want to work for, find what information they're reading, and read it as well. There's also going to be a secondary use, and we're going to talk about that, because knowing the information that I'm looking at is going to help you begin to you know, create that relationship with me. All right, finding your targets. God, you guys have Google. Google's awesome. Google's a great stalking mechanism, OK? Because people don't realize how much Google indexes. They really don't. If you put someone's name and an industry modifier into Google, if they've done anything remotely public, it's there. 
okay? If you put Tom Martin in advertising up here, the first six things that you're gonna see are all me, and three of the five photos are me. Now granted, I write for Ad Age, I do social media, I publish on blogs, I wrote a book. I'm really public, so I'm super easy to find. Not everybody's that easy to find. But what I will tell you is this right here is gold. If you will spend some time and get really good search in Google, you can find almost anybody. And I know this because my firm does this for a living. We socially stalk people for clients all the time. We get paid for it, it's great. <laughs> Get really good at Google. The other place, Twitter. I saw some of you kind of wince when I said Twitter. You need to be on Twitter. Twitter defaults to public. Because it defaults to public, everything you do on Twitter is searchable by Google and also by Twitter. Okay? What people don't realize is that one tweet, oh, it's a, you know, it's a piece of information. But if I go pull any of your, who here is on Twitter? Okay, so if I go pull any of your Twitter feeds, and I go back and I take the last 500 tweets and I read them, I promise you, I'm gonna know more about you than you ever wanted me to know. I'm gonna know if you're in a relationship. If you are, I'm gonna know who you're dating. I'm gonna know if you like pets. I'm gonna know what you like to drink. I'm gonna know what you like to eat. I'm gonna know your favorite restaurant. I'm gonna know what classes you take. I know what school you're going to. I'm gonna know, I'm gonna be able to map your network, find out all your little high school buds that you go to college with, I'm going to be able to find out if you're a soccer player, if you're into lacrosse. I'm going to find all of that out right there. Because when I string 500 of them together, I'm going to get a really good picture of who you are. It's the ultimate stalking tool. So if you're trying to get to someone like me, you're trying to build a persona of who I am and what my interests are, and what might you talk to me about that would get me interested, man, this is the mother load. Okay? So if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter for no other reason than just to stalk people. And if you're thinking about getting into the digital space and the digital marketing space, we're all on here. Some of us are more active than others, but we're all on here, okay? So get on here and use it as a research tool. We'll talk about another thing you can do in a second. The other thing is LinkedIn. How many of you are active users of LinkedIn? Okay, how many of you pay for LinkedIn? Good man, you're the smartest man in the room right now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to call your parents. Tell them that you saw this guy in New Orleans speak, and he said that if you say, Mom and Dad, this man told me that if you want me off your payroll faster, you need to pay for me to have a professional LinkedIn account. It's only $25 a month. The reason for that is this search is super, super powerful. And if you pay for the professional version, it's even more powerful because they unlock added dimensions on the search for you. And you can really start to say, okay, I want to be working on packaged goods. I want to be an assistant brand manager. You can look up brand manager, current title, you know, packaged goods. Or if you want to work for P&G, say, I want every brand manager who lives in Cincinnati, which is where P&G is headquartered. You can really get super, super targeted. And that's going to help you find the people that are your targets that you're going to want to start creating relationships with. The other thing it allows you to do is it will show you who's looked at your profile. Okay, and once you start actively trying to form relationships with people, they will, they'll look you up. And it'll say, hey, Tom Martin just looked at your profile, which is really cool, because now you know, hey, I've got someone's attention. Now you don't just you know, reach out and go, hey, I heard you're checking me out on LinkedIn. <laughs> but you do know, hey, this person, I might be able to try to link in with them, I might be able to send them a connection if you're in a group together, which we'll talk about in a second. I might be able to start a conversation within a group, because I've obviously caught their attention, they've looked at me. Really, really super, super good tool, worth all $25. So tell your mom and dad, if you want me to get a job, this is what I need you to do for me. And then make ample use of it. This is quickly becoming probably the second most powerful platform in social media because it's been rediscovered by people. And people are starting to figure out it's not just an electronic resume, and LinkedIn is taking steps to make sure people use it more like Facebook. Groups. When you do find someone on LinkedIn, immediately look at what groups they're in. Pay attention. Open a spreadsheet and document. What you're really looking for is you're trying to find the groups that have as a target-rich environment, that have as many of your people that are target audience people for you in it as possible. You also are gonna look for groups that are highly active that may not have your target audience in it, but it has people that do what you might wanna do. Reason for this is twofold. In a group, you can talk to anybody. You can jump in on any conversation, right? 
you can begin to demonstrate your ability to, to, to think, to write, to communicate, to persuade, all of that, critical thinking. You can do that as part of these robust conversations that occur. The other reason you want to join the group is because LinkedIn doesn't allow you to email me unless we're connected, unless we're in the same group. If we're in the same group, it's as though we're a first-person connection, and you get to bypass those safeties, unless I you know, say that you're a spammer, in which case they turn you off. But until you do that, you now can talk to me. You don't have to link in with me. You don't have to do an in-mail. It opens up a line of communication that otherwise you would not have with me. Now, we talked about the propinquity points, and I said over here is content. The reason you want to read the content is, one, you want to be reading the same content your prospective employers are reading because that's going to help get you smarter. It's educating you. The second reason is it's going to give you something to talk about. Go back to Twitter. As you find people on Twitter who you think, man, you're somebody I might want to work for, or you work at a company, or you work in an industry, you know, you're somebody who either I would want to work for or you might know somebody I would want to work for, put them into a Twitter list. Anybody here use lists, Twitter lists? It's very simple. Go to YouTube and say, how do I create a Twitter list? Put them into a Twitter list. It does two things for you. One, it makes it really easy to follow them. Secondly, it allows you to go back and periodically look at what they're sharing. You just click on every one of these links. And what you do is you open a spreadsheet, and you start cataloging what websites are being shared. Not the, not the article, just the core website, all the way up to the .com. And every time you find the instance of a web site, you add one more share to that you know, share column. What you're going to do is you're going to start to find the propinquity points for the industries you want to work in. You're going to say, this is where the people who work in that industry go to get information. What that's going to allow you to do is possibly interact with them there, because people will comment on things and share. But also, let's say you're following me, and you see that all of a sudden I start sharing a whole lot of stuff about mobile's effect on social media. And let's say you find something someplace else, a Pew report or, a, or an Edison report or something, and it's like, wow, this is all about mobile. You know, that Tom Martin guy would love this. Now you can just tweet me. Hey, Tom Martin, saw this, noticed that you do, you've been sharing a lot around mobile and so, uh, social media, thought you would find this report really interesting. Boom, off it goes. I'm going to look at the report. If it's smart, if it's good stuff, I might even, hey, thank you. If you find anything else like that, you know, send it my way. A, it's polite, and B, you're now a human curator for me. You just made my life easier. But most importantly, you now have a dialogue. You have an opportunity to have a dialogue with me. You're somebody, not just one of the 12,000 people that follow me, right? Same thing on LinkedIn, email, Facebook. Content is the ultimate conversation starter because it's easy, OK? You can share the conversation. You can share the content. It gets you an audience. It gets you an opportunity to talk with me. And here's why that is so important. You've heard me probably say this five times today. You want to start the conversation now. Because here's the thing, folks. If you're waiting for the interview to interview, you've lost the job. You can tweet that. That's great advice. <laughs> if you're waiting for the interview, You've lost the job because somewhere somebody smarter than you has already built a relationship with that person. They've already talked to them. They've already positioned themselves as the preferred solution. The days of, hey, let's go interview a bunch of people we've never met before are over. Those people do show up at interviews. They seldom get the job unless they are one hell of an interview. Part of the reason is, as employers, we no longer trust the interview process. Because then you think about it, it's sort of like speed dating. You know, I'm going to interview you for an hour. Someone else can interview you for an hour, an hour, half hour. And then at the end of the day, we're going to decide to hand you a job that's going to be a relationship that we hope is going to last two to three years minimum. It's really scary. But if I've been talking with you online for a year, and man, this kid's always smart. He's always sending good stuff. We have these great debates. He's a really good critical thinker. Well, hell, you're already at the top of the stack, man. In fact, you might even get the email about the invisible job that I won't bother to post. I'm not going to even post it. I'm just going to put it out there and go, hey, aren't you graduating in May? Any interest in this? Because if so, I'd like to have you down. I, I, I want to talk. I think you could be really good for this. Because you know what? It makes my life easier. I don't have time to interview people. And neither do the people who you're trying to get jobs with. Don't wait for the interview. Build your relationships today that you can use tomorrow and many tomorrows. And even if I can't hire you, 
I might know somebody who can, because guess what? When it's time for me to hire, the first thing I do is ping all my friends. Hey, I'm looking for entry level this, that, the other. Anybody got any good names? Because I don't want to go through the interview process. That's the big hidden secret. People who are hiring today don't have time to go through the interview process. They don't want to go through the interview process. They want someone to short circuit it for them, and we're using social to do that. Now, don't laugh. My name gets misspelled all the time. If I could tell you how many times I've been called Tim in an email. And I get it. O and I is a very common misspelling. If you accidentally put TMO, Apple automatically makes it T-I-M. Why, I don't know. And it's not even that big of a deal. But it's a big deal because it shows me you're not paying attention. You're not having attention to detail. In the first couple of years out, you're not going to be a thinker. You are going to be a doer. Don't think you're going to step out of college and be writing marketing strategies and all that. You're not. You're going to be helping someone else implement a marketing strategy. And that person's going to want to know that they can hand you something, walk away, and not need to talk to you again until it's finished, and it'll be done right, 100%, detail-oriented. I don't even have to worry about it. That's what everybody wants. Okay? And it starts right here. That has actually happened. I have received resumes with the person's name spelled wrong. Swear to God, right at the top, in big 18-point aerial. But you know what? Having grown up in the ad business, you know, where the, you know where the typos usually are in an ad? In the headline. Because your brain can make yourself read whatever you want to read. And you know it's your name, and you know you know how to spell your name. So you don't really pay attention to it, and then it comes in wrong. Pay attention to the little details. I have watched people literally throw resumes away because the cover letter had Tim instead of Tom. They won't even read it as a matter of principle. Pay attention to the details. You are not talking to your friends when you are applying for a job. Even if we're in social media, even if we're in email, which can tend to be more casual in nature, right? And the level of communication today is much more casual than it used to be. And I get that. That's cool. That's fine. But I once had a gentleman, college kid, who was trying to get a job in our graphics department and had gotten a hold of my email address and was just sending me his portfolio, hoping that I would then share it with our creative director, right? Because he was trying to work his way in. And he sent it to me as a zip file. Well, we had a policy at the agency. We don't open zip files from anybody we don't know. You just don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a standard corporate IT security thing. You don't open a zip file because God knows what's going to pop out. Well, this is what I got back. So I sent him, Charlie, thanks. You know, we have a policy, yada, yada, yada. Hi. I don't need to have my name addressed, I guess. Because there is such a range of work, I, lowercase, tend to only send over relevant examples. The file isn't that, all capital, big, in case I couldn't read the word that, I guess. Could I send over info, the info as a PowerPoint? Notice we totally lost all capitalization here. <laughs> Best, C, because we're now on a first letter basis. <laughs> I am not making this up, guys. This is real. That actually happened. We've, we have blocked out the person's name to you know, protect the, uh, the parties. But C and I, <laughs> anybody want to guess what email C got back? That's right. You know why C didn't get an email back? Come on. Huh? Yeah? Why don't I want to hire him? Uh-huh. No. Yes, he was an ass. Let's get that straight. Didn't spell his name. You're missing the big one, though. No? Did he address the security issue? No. So, yeah, he's an ass. He's an idiot. He firing off at a guy who can hire him and, you know, that and all this other hoopla. So, yeah, he's obviously somebody who isn't very mature. But most importantly, he didn't address the issue. I raised a security issue, and he's talking file size and relevancy and all this stuff. What this kid told me is, I don't listen. And guess what? You don't get an email back. You don't get hired. So when you do communicate, obviously I do this for effect. It's fun. You guys have all paid attention when you saw that. 
But when you do communicate, really, really read, especially in the written word, what people are doing and saying. Miscommunications in email are so easy because you don't realize 90-something percent of your communication is, is non-visual, I mean non-verbal. You lose all that in this, okay? So really, really pay attention because, yeah, you know, this, you know, got sent around the agency because it was funny. Look what this Yahoo sent me. You know, all of the senior partners, we all had a great time with this, and I now have a phenomenal slide to use in, in presentations. Thank you, C. <laughs> But the real point is, pay attention. You're going to be a doer, not a thinker. You'll eventually be a thinker, but you're going to be a doer. So show them you can do properly. One last thing, and I'll, show, and I'll leave it up uh, for q and I've showed you a lot of what to do. What I haven't shown you is the very first step that I want each and every one of you to take. I want you to Google yourself. Google yourself often. Here's why. You're lucky, I should say, I'm lucky. People my age all, you know, we get together and we're all like, God, can you imagine if we had social media when we were in college? Holy cow, I would have never gotten hired. <laughs> Everything that you put out in a public environment stays public forever. It, Google never forgets anything. And even stuff you think is private has a funny way of going public. And decisions you make today are going to affect you 20 years from today. So this right here, anybody ever see this? Is this even still on? God, I hope not. One of the worst shows in the world. Oh, my goodness. Anyways, so we have a gal coming in. She's uh, interviewing for a media position with our media director, and she's smart and well-spoken, and um, she keeps referencing that, you know, she's getting interviews and people, they seem to be going well, but she, you know, no one's offering her a job. She really wants to break into the business and everything. And so our media director's like, whoa, this doesn't make sense. Somebody should have at least offered this girl a job. So what does she do? She Googles her. This is what pops up. She was on Flava of Love. <laughs> and worse, she was like the second one kicked off. So she didn't even make it to the end. Needless to say, we found out why she wasn't get hired, same reason we weren't going to hire her, because we could not risk having a client find that, especially if that client was female, especially if that client was very feminist-oriented. Now, why anyone in their right mind would think this is a good life choice, <laughs> I don't know. But then again, there's a lot of people doing stupid stuff these days that I don't understand. My point to you is this. Everything you do in this world can be public, and sometimes you make it public. Go back, Google yourself. Go through your Twitter feeds. Go through your Facebook. Check everything. You would be surprised how many pictures you guys put on Facebook that you think are private that aren't. Again, I do this for a living. I stalk people for clients, <laughs> and I scare people. My favorite thing to do is to call a prospect and have them go, ah, oh, we don't need that. And I go, really? You know, how am I going to use that? I said, well, let me tell you. I've got your name and email address. Um, you are in a relationship. Either you had a big race or you were, somebody was getting married back in January because you were trying to fit into the right dress. You've got a daughter. She likes pizza. Blah, 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 blah. In 15 minutes of searching, I was able to find all that. And she's like, how did you know all that? What's so what happened? It's on your Facebook. Oh, my Facebook's private. Not all of it. <laughs> and that's what happens. Pay attention, because I promise you, every employer is Googling you. We are all Googling you. Clean up your past. Don't necessarily have to make it private. Just clean it up. Because if you make it private, frankly, that's a big old warning bell, too. What are you doing that you can't put it up on Twitter? Clean it up and understand you are changing points in your life. You are about to go where, from a place where it's cool to be able to do body shots in the bar to, oh crap, that's going to get me fired if I do body shots in the bar and it gets found out. You're changing places in your life. What was acceptable in your 20s is not going to be acceptable in your post-collegiate 20s. Prepare yourself for that. Prepare your social profiles. Prepare everything you do, because I promise you, you're going to get Googled, and what they find will absolutely affect whether or not you can get that job, just like you're Googling them in hopes of finding stuff that can help you get that job. Now, everything you've just heard is right there. 
Uh, I can't cover it all today. We've got about 10 minutes left to do Q&A, but if you decide you want to learn more about it, grab that book. You're